Your home for principles, not politics. It's the Seth Liebson Show. Now, here's Seth. Don't change that dial. This is not Seth. It is Lisa DiPasquale, columnist for Breitbart.com, author of Finding Mr. Righteous, all-around good person, and co-host of PoliticalPunks.com. And I'm so proud to have the original political punk, Ann Coulter, on the line. Hey, Ann. Hey, good to talk to you, Lisa. <laughs> You're sitting in for a fantastic radio host. I know. It's really nerve-wracking. Thankfully, I have an awesome producer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it would be. Uh, I'm I'm a perennial guest. Yeah, I think it would. The few times I've sat in for someone, I hate it. <laughs> well, you know, I remember you sitting in. I want to say it was Ted Nugent's radio show a while back. Well, when I first started this, I didn't realize what a big deal it was. So now I just say no. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, that around the time I came out with High Crimes and Misdemeanors, my first book. I sat in at one time or another for everybody, for Hannity, for Oliver North, mm-hmm. um, for everybody. And then I realized, this sucks. I it's a lot of work. Interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> I should have just asked you to write questions for me <laughs> to make sure I ask all the right things. But yeah, the- that's the odd thing. You'd think it would be easy since I am a little like Hannity. Um, or, or I think I would be like Hannity if I ever hosted, which is to say a frustrated guest mm-hmm. where – um, you know, get, you get the entire answer out in the question. Yeah. Um, and the questions are, of course, all about saving our nation right now. <laughs> well, first, let me ask you, I mean, I call you the original political punk. What do you think makes a political punk? Well, you've defined it. Um, I defer to, to you on that. I would say um, the conservatives I prefer listening to, mm-hmm. I've never really put together a set of rules, but one is that you're not working for anyone. <laughs> like Gavin paid. McInnes, right? You get fired all the time. <laughs> I do get fired all the time. Um, and I also think that happens to be the secret, secret of happiness in mm-hmm. life. But um, I've just seen so many people, whether it's at law firms or um, TV networks um, or radio stations, um, and, and also be, often people who are being interviewed on radio, even friends of mine, I've mm-hmm. wanted to point out during interviews, well, now, wait a second, you're being paid by that candidate. Mm-hmm. I am just an American citizen who happens to be an aspiring agoraphobe, so I sit home reading all day, mm-hmm. and that's how I reached my conclusion. You reached your conclusion because you got a check. <laughs> um, and I do think TVs should have chirons when people are being paid by a particular candidate or whomever or a, a lobbyist, whatever, to say what you're being paid to take that position. This is not your opinion because when you have people, and there are a fair number of them, who go in and out of just being regular pundits and regular writers making their own opinion mm-hmm. and being paid to take a particular position. That's, that's one thing. And the other thing that I, that I love about you, Lisa DiPasquale, is um, – <laughs> I'm so glad. I love, I love your book. You know I love it. Um, it's so clever and original and important. And bless you for not writing another one of these. Um, I'm a conservative, and I'm a fill-in-the-blank. Girl, <laughs> gay, black. Um, you know, oh, wow, Atheist. good for you. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Now we have to hear the exact same thing that we've read in 8 billion other books. Do you have a point besides, look at me. <laughs> well, thank you. And now this is the first instance of a host sending a guest a check. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> exactly. But it is a great book. People should read it. Um, though, um, first, you have to read Adios American. I'm mm-hmm. not saying that because it's my book. I'm saying it because the next month, I, I just tweeted this out, the next, uh, probably two months, um, and, and really then continuing the rest of the year. This is the most important period in American history since right after the revolution. This is when we decide, does America continue to exist, or do we keep importing millions of third worlders, turning our country into a third world hellhole, and we're Brazil, and that's the end of America, so good luck to the rest mm-hmm. of the world when you're hit by tsunamis and warlords and Nazis, because America won't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this is what's about to be, to be decided, so I just I can't think of anything else right now. 
Well, you know, I, I hate to be one of those people that says, well, I've been saying for years, but I'm going to be one of those people. <laughs> I've been saying for years that you and, and Rush, you're sort of the Rush Limbaugh of the publishing industry just, you know, by sales, but also as sort of being a standard bearer for um, important issues. And you write something, everyone says you've gone too far, and then a few minute, a few months or years later, it's accepted thought. And as you mentioned right now, the issue is immigration. Why do you think it's it's resonating with voters, even voters that aren't on border states? Um, but well, they've been inundated too. They see what's happening. Um, they talk to their relatives who know what's happening. I mean, the danger is that maybe the Democrats have succeeded and they've, they've changed the demographics. They brought brought in enough ringers to vote for the Democrats and post 1970 immigrants. Um, nothing like pre-1970 immigrants. They are voting 8 to 2 for the Democrats. We're bringing them in at a clip of well more than a million a year. That's gone. It, 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 it was allowed by Teddy Kennedy's 1965 Immigration Act, but it really picked up speed under Clinton, then Bush, and, and it's been like a rocket under Obama. It may be that the Democrats have changed the demographics of this nation enough that the entire country has become California and no Republican can ever be elected again, at which point... Um, you know, good luck with your little arguments about the XM Bank and <laughs> and gay marriage and how we're going to repeal and replace Obamacare. None of that matters. All that matters are the voters. And and at least, you know, Donald Trump will let us know. Is it too late? Because if it's too late, good. I can stop writing about politics. I'll write fiction. I'll, put, I'll finally put out my cookbook. Um, <laughs> but the country will be finished. And I'll just be glad I don't have any children because because that's it. It's not only, as I was just saying, it's not only lights out for America. It's, it's lights out for civilization. Yeah, I mean, where would we go? There is no place to go, <laughs> and there will be no America to save the rest of the world. Um, who was it who, who crushed the Nazi war machine? Was that Mexico? Was mm-hmm. that China? Um, who is constantly rushing in after earthquakes, tsunamis, rescuing countries from from vicious warlords? What, 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 Israel will be gone. Mm-hmm. The, the, the last outpost of civilization, the only thing that stops this constant migration of the poorest of the poor of the entire world to the civilized um, parts of the world, most of all the United States of America, is when the entire globe is the same. Mm-hmm. So there's no reason to move from one country to another. You're you're all poor. You all we all have the state. It'll be there'll be the rich will do well. They've got really cheap maids. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, fine. We'll have like the democratic dream. Dream will all be equal, equally poor, equally uh, subservient to the rich. Right. They won't be equal. Yeah. <laughs> they won't be equal at all. The wealthy in Brazil live quite well and have batteries mm-hmm. of servants, but they also need batteries of bodyguards. Mm-hmm. Um, no, this is and and you know I begged, I begged three Republican presidential candidates to take this issue up before I'd even written Adios America. Um, I thought immigration was just going to be a few chapters, a large part of the book I was writing. It was only when I discovered um, all the things the government and the media were hiding from us that I realized, oh my gosh, I'm sitting on a powder keg. <laughs> um, but I begged three. Three Republican candidates for president to take this issue up. I, I, I mapped it out for them, wrote a couple pages, and one case sat down for three, four-hour private dinner making the case that Donald Trump has made. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't need – I, I, I never imagined he was going to run for president. I had no idea what a magnificent human being and presidential candidate he'd be. He see, saw me on that Jorge Ramos interview a week before the book came out, and his people – I was on my way to the airport. His people sent me an email saying, Mr. Trump would like a copy of your book. Mm-hmm. Can He's he been afford on it? this, but, <laughs> but he got the copy of the book, and, and, and I, knew, I knew Americans wanted to stop that. I mean, American people have been begging politicians if they just open their eyes. Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, have conspired to slip through an amnesty three times in the last decade. Mm-hmm. Um, three times, and three times it was shut down, not by some you know Republican presidential candidate standing up, not because some television conservative television network alerted the American people to what was going on. No, by hook or crook, you know, three talk radio hosts, a couple of bloggers, um, and thank God the Drudge Report. Mm-hmm. 
would tell them what's going on, and the American people, just ordinary average Americans, would call into Congress and say, no, no, we don't want amnesty. They three times have shut down the congressional switchboards, and still Republicans can't get the message? Well, you know, and that's what I don't understand. I mean, for all the people that want to complain about Trump just on, you know, say the celebrity level, right. he's giving you a guidebook for the issues that you need to talk about in order to get higher in the polls, but still they don't want to do it. Right, right. And the other thing I was thinking, I may write this up next week. Um, I mean, I still have, you know, some friends will say, oh, but he's vulgar, and why can't we have why can't we have someone more like Romney saying this? Well, you sit back and think about that question seriously. Look at the hellfire that has rained down on Donald Trump for saying what is very popular with the mm-hmm. American people. No amnesty, build a wall, no refugees, a pause on all immigration, mm-hmm. um, deporting the felons. He says that, and the entire media come after him, you know, like he, like he just flew two planes into the World Trade Center. <laughs> no one, try to imagine Mitt Romney saying this stuff. Does mm-hmm. he have the tools to deal with that? I don't think so. I think we have been waiting for um, a brash television celebrity who's comfortable in front of a gaggle of computers who knows how to fight back and think on his feet. Everything that seems like a disadvantage with Trump, I now say, I mean, I used to just say, I don't care. I don't care. As long as he's good on immigration, as I said in a famous tweet after his immigration policy paper came Uh out, I don't care if Donald Trump performs abortions in the White House as long as he keeps this immigration policy. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, that's hyperbole, but on the other hand, it's true. How are you going to overrule Roe v. Wade if you can't elect a Republican president? (laughs) Well, and that's the thing that bothers me about people that, you know, harp on your on your tweets. Um, You know, it's as if. They've never heard of you before. They've never read your writing. They don't read your column every week like I do. And I hope you can stick around uh, one more segment. I'd love to talk to you about your column this week. Yes, yes, I love that one. All right, great. Stick around. We'll be back with more Ann Coulter. Hey, it's Lisa DePasquale in for Seth Liebson, and still on the line with me is the awesome Ann Coulter. I hate when people introduce you as uh, everyone, or what do they say? Like, someone who needs no introduction. Yeah, someone who needs no introduction, <laughs> or whether you love or hate her. Right, right. Like, pick a side. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid to say it. <laughs> uh Oh, can I just tell you, I was listening to your interview with Eric Metaxas uh, last week, who's also on uh, the Salem Radio Network here, and I loved that you called him a brat. (laughs) That was so funny to me. (laughs) He is really fantastic. Yeah, and you know, I was talking yesterday about my book and how awesome it was, um, how big of a part you and Eric, but first you, in introducing me to to Eric's books and and my conversion to being a Christian. And you know, I know that you have... uh, a ton of New York Times bestsellers and a, a great column, but uh, you should uh, always know that you put at least one Christian in the world. That's even more important. I'm <laughs> so happy about that. And it's so genuine, and it comes through in your book, which is such a clever book because it's it's chick lit. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you know, I think Eric and I were both a little alarmed <laughs> <laughs> at some of at some of the stuff you're getting into, but it's so genuine, it's so heartfelt, and then wham, you said it. Exa- it was so. That's exactly the way you're supposed to become a Christian, mm-hmm. and I don't want to give away how how it happens, but it, it's genuine, it's real, it's a fun read. Maybe maybe not for your grandfather, but for the <laughs> gals in your life. <laughs> Actually, maybe it would be fun for your grandfather. <laughs> I, I let my my father read the chapter about my dog. I, I told him he couldn't read the rest. <laughs> He's probably reading with a flashlight under his covers at night, like he used to do when we were little kids. 
Uh, well, enough about my book, even though, you know, I love talking about it. And, it and is more... a great book, and people <laughs> should read it. I, 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 I'm not saying that. Look, I'm doing, I'm doing three radio segments with Lisa. That's mm-hmm. how much respect I have for her. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, I want to get back to your column this week, um, because you talk about the fake stories that people on our side are passing around in order to discredit Trump, which I think is a huge mistake, and I'm really sick of this culture of, you know, it's, um, have you seen that stupid ABC, ABC show, What Would You Do? You know, where no. they create, they create this fake, like, oh, this guy's being a racist. What are the, um, other people in the diner going to do? And it's just like all these rape and, um, hate crime hoaxes from the left. The anti-Trump folks have this knee jerk inclination to believe whatever confirms their beliefs when they put out these stories. And there's, not even the conservative media, as you mentioned, are even doing an ounce of, of research to see if things are true. Yeah, the, the attack on Trump is really something. I mean, I describe it in the first chapter of, of Adios America, how, how it's both the conservative and the liberal media who do not want to talk about, about this constant importation of the third world. We're just going to keep it going, keep it going. And don't, don't talk about it. Don't let the rubes find out what we're doing to the country. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, part of it is clearly the, the rich want their cheap labor subsidized by the middle class. It's not, it's not that cheap when you count the child care, the schools, the roads, the premature babies. No, but that's all covered by the taxpayer. Mm-hmm. They, the, the businesses, the, the, the fancy ladies on Park Avenue, they get the cheap maid and the cheap workers. Um, so you have, you have it, it really is a beautiful example of Lenin's, Lenin's saying, we will sell the rope. You will sell the rope to us with which we will, we will hang you. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's what's happening. How, how do these rich people, <laughs> alleged Republicans, alleged libertarians, how libertarian do they think the country is going to be when, when Americans are being outvoted by Mexicans and Somalis? Have yeah. they thought about that? <laughs> well, I always wonder, you know, these libertarians especially who, you know, don't want borders, uh, do they have fences in their house? Do they leave their doors unlocked? Well, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. And I am more genuinely libertarian than most people yeah. call themselves libertarian. But it's just, it's, it's a teenaged affectation when, it's, when they start talking about abortion and, and open borders. Mm-hmm. Um, I know lots of smart libertarians. They're not like these, these whack jobs. <laughs> um, well, no, this is an this is an existential election. Will America continue to exist? Is it too late? I don't think it is. I wouldn't have written Adios America. Donald Trump wouldn't be running for president if mm-hmm. he thought it was too late. Um, but I really hope the voters. I mean, it's going to count. What's interesting about what Trump is doing? Oh, sorry, I was answering <laughs> why they believe the hoaxes. Yeah. It's even worse than I thought, mm-hmm. and you see it with the way Trump is being treated. I, I mean, I understand that when you're, when you're in a crunch and you've been pushing for one candidate over another, um, you start to really hate even fellow Republicans. I feel that way about, about a number of Republicans. But I'm telling you, listeners, this time it's different. It's not about gay marriage. It's not about abortion. It's not about your tax rate or, or repealing Obamacare. And my life has been wrecked by Obamacare. Because we lose all of those issues Mm -hmm. if we don't stop our current legal immigration and illegal immigration, the anger baby issue. Nobody else would have raised that but Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Um, Nobody else would have done it. I'll let you win on everything else going <laughs> forward. Please just let me have America. Yeah. <laughs> well, and a lot of people are attributing Trump's rise and I guess to some extent uh, Bernie Sanders' rise. Oh, I, I still think that Bernie is just sort of a, a spoof candidate to make Hillary look young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mally makes her look like a statesman. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, people just attribute it to anger. I mean, I think it, it's it's more than that. It's about the issues. I also think, you know, when I look at Trump and hear him talk, um, you know, that's an alpha male. We've had a beta, um, you yeah. know, for so long. And you, you get the sense that, you know, even if he doesn't tell us the specifics, I can believe that he's going to be in a meeting with Putin and I'm not going to be afraid about whether or not he's standing up for America. Yes. 
Yes, and by the way, he has given us specific. That's something mm-hmm. they keep saying. Yeah, true. I, I, yeah, I mean, he keep, he's giving us the exact specifications of the wall. All mm-hmm. we get from the other candidates are, oh, walls don't work, we'll have a virtual wall, we'll use mm-hmm. drones. You know, walls aren't particularly effective. No, Trump says, I'll build a wall. Mm-hmm. Um, he says, we're going to end the anchor baby policy. He says, we're going to start start deporting them, do what Eisenhower did, and then you'll get some self-deportation. Um, as, as happened under Eisenhower, Eisenhower, as I'm sure your listeners know, um, um, he had Operation Wetback. Um, and it, so it took like, you know, 600 border guards. They just, you know, walked north, deported the illegals. And once illegal aliens living in the country saw that someone was seriously enforcing the immigration law, nine out of ten just left on their own. Yeah. Well, stay tuned. We're going to uh, come right back with more Ann Coulter, and I'm going to ask her the difference between a real American and a real Republican and why those are no longer the same thing. Hey, it's Lisa DePasquale in for Seth Liebson, and still on the line is Ann Coulter. And uh, hey, Ann, welcome back. Thank you. Always <laughs> good to chat with you, Lisa. <laughs> So we were just talking about your column, and you write at the, uh, at the column that you can read at com. You say that a real American and a real Republican used to be the same thing. Um, why are they different now? And was this a change that you saw before the Trump surge? Yes, but he really brings it out in stark relief. Um, and the way I noticed it was there are all these claims – um, mostly from the conservative media, that Trump isn't a real Republican and this is a new thing and mm-hmm. he, he, he wants a single health care payer program and this, that, and the other thing. Um, and, you know, I won't go through all of them. It, it's, it's nonsense. Um, the the health care thing comes from a statement, for one thing, he wasn't in office, he wasn't political, he's mm-hmm. a businessman in a very liberal city. Um, so his off-the-cuff remarks I wouldn't take to be you know, his deepest held principles. Um, But what he said about um, national health care (laughs) was, he said something about, well, you know, they have it in England and Canada. It works good for those countries. We're fine up there. They have great health care. But I don't think it works here. Mm -hmm. That's just a Trump way of saying something. He was being nice to the other country. He was not saying he supported health care. The one thing I I, I think, I guess you could say he's, he's kind of flipped on was, um, he said, again, as a businessman in New York, and he explained it as mm-hmm. being a businessman in New York. Mm-hmm. He, he said, well, I'm, I'm a New Yorker. Um, I don't really care about abortion. Yeah. <laughs> um, come on, you have to do that. I mean, you're being silly and disingenuous if, if you're pretending that what the, the, the donations a businessman gives. Um, look at Rupert Murdoch's donations. His mm-hmm. newspaper, <laughs> New York Post, endorsed Hillary Clinton for Senate. They have to do business in these states. Um, you donate to whomever is going to win. Um, but the one strain that has been absolutely consistent throughout Trump's life is he has always cared about Americans first. Mm-hmm. And in important ways, and that story about him saving mm-hmm. Annabelle Hill's farm, he just saw her on TV. And it's the most heartbreaking story this Peach Farm in Georgia had been in the family for four generations. Her 67-year-old husband had just committed suicide 20 minutes before the foreclosure sale, hoping the insurance money would pay for the farm. Um, They had had a few years of bad weather and probably a few bad economic decisions. Trump sees her on TV and calls her up and says, "Um, don't worry, Annabelle, we're going to save that farm. We're going to get your land back. I'm pledging 20000 right now. I'm going to go on a campaign. And he did. And the more detailed version of the story that I didn't give in, in my column Immediately, he called the bank and, in his Trumpian way, Mm -hmm. said, you go through with this foreclosure sale, you're going to get so many suits. (laughs) Well, and the great thing about the story is it was like 30 years ago. 30 years ago. This was 1986. A few months later, she flew up with her whole family, had Christmas dinner at Trump Towers after burning the mortgage in the lobby of Trump Towers. It was a big event. The other businessmen, and God bless them, there were two others, one from Dallas, one from Atlanta, involved with Trump in this, and the, the one from Atlanta said, look, this is all because of Trump. Mm-hmm. Most of the money that we raised, and they raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, came from the New York area. Um, that was back in 1986, and the quotes he gave to newspapers at the time were things like the one quote I put in the column was, 
Um, Trump said, you know, we send lots of money to all these foreign countries who don't give a damn about us, but we don't care about the American farmer. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Americans would like a politician who likes us Mm -hmm. more than he likes foreigners. (laughs) And I haven't seen that for a long time. Well, and there's your New York values, right? You said most of the donations came from New York. I almost made a joke about it in the column. But I thought, <laughs> uh, I, I know what they mean. I mean, I don't think to, uh, Cruz should have said that. I, I, I mean, Cruz would be my second choice, but mm-hmm. I just it doesn't really matter. The rest mm-hmm. of these guys are rearranging chairs on the Titanic. We need Trump to save the country, and then we can argue about all the other issues. Um, but... I do think it's, it's kind of mean to be insulting an area of the country, even if they are liberal. You know, you're running for president. Well, that seems to be the common thread. I mean, people insulting, you know, Trump voters. It's like, you yes. know, eventually you're going to want these people. And then they con- they say, oh, well, they, they don't vote Republican anyway. It's like, yes, that's the point, to continue adding. Yes. I think Trump <laughs> is going to get the largest group. And this is why, I, I, I mean, who knows? Maybe I'll be totally wrong. Um, though I do think he's going to win um, both the nomination and the presidency, um, he will get the largest number of people who haven't voted for 10, 20, maybe 30 years Mm -hmm. of anyone who's ever run for president. And that can't be captured by pollsters, because an honest pollster just can't say, well, okay, this person hasn't voted for 20 years, but I think this time he's going to come out and vote. To be an honest pollster, you have to say, we have to go on something objective. Have they been voting? Mm-hmm. Even if they say they love Trump or whomever and I'm going to vote this time, never have before. I think they really are. And I know polls can't capture that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just, I just think this is going to be huge. I mean, for years before I wrote Adios America, for years, at least since Bush was pushing amnesty, immigration is all I've been talking about. And even when other issues are in the news and I'm giving speeches to people who aren't expecting it, GOP groups and Lincoln Day dinners and Tea Party groups, um, and corporate groups. Mm-hmm. And I'd talk about whatever was in the news, but for, for since, well, 10 years now, I'd, I'd slip in immigration. That mm-hmm. would always be a part of the speech. And the reaction from the audience, and they're not expecting it. I'm not just standing there yelling out Ronald Reagan's name or Sarah Palin's name. I'm presenting <laughs> something they haven't been hearing about every night on Fox News. And they were always on their feet, so enthusiastic. I've just known Americans have been saying, please, please stop for decades now, and no one in Washington will listen to them. But Donald Trump will because he cares about America first. Well, thank you so much. And I know, I have no doubt that uh, Ann Coulter cares about America first. And thank you so much for being on and for everything that you've done for me. I mean, you've really been my writing mentor and friend for so long. Um, hard to believe that, that, that we. an <laughs> honor. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks again. And everyone go read that column and. and all back columns at AnnCoulter.com and be sure to buy Adios America for yourself and 10 of your closest friends. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Bye-bye.